All right, let's start. I have recorded this little video because I'm teaching a class on technology evolution and uh, this is the coronavirus time. So I thought, okay, let's record it. Let's give it to the students to see. But I have another reason to do this as well. And that is that I want to help my colleagues at BI and the University of Oslo by showing them how to record a video. So let's hope this, wor this one works out. So I'm recording this looking into an iPhone. I'm sitting in my kitchen. I have natural light coming from this direction. I have a professional light on this side. And uh, I'm talking with the iPhone in eye level, but it's kind of boring to do that. So I have recruited my daughter, uh, she's sitting over there, to uh, listen to me while I'm giving this talk. And uh, she is a student of mathematics and physics, but a little technology evolution won't hurt. Uh, except I suspect she's heard a lot of these stories before. And the reason I have a person sitting right next to me is because you want to change the conversation when you do video teaching. You don't want to talk to a room full of students because the students, when they're looking at this, are sitting one by one and you want to change it into a conversation with one person. So I'm also using an iPad like this and I'm projecting that iPad and that means that I can, I can draw on the, on the screen and present that way. So let's get going. Before we start, hi, my name is Espen Anderson. I teach at uh, BI Norwegian Business School and I teach at the University of Oslo, a computer science department. Well, this is going to be a talk on how technology changes over time and also introducing the concept of disruptive innovations. Now, before we start, let me give a little intro to why I think this is important. Um, not just for people who do technology, but, but also uh, why it's important for, for everybody, um, especially people in business, to know about this. And this is how I see the world. Technology is a main driver of how things change, the business changes. And so we have technology and technology changes the business environment. It changes what companies can do. When the business environment changes, you have to change what you do. And uh, so and that in business, that's called changing your strategy. So and for me, strategy is basically how you make money, how you survive long term, how you change and, and what you do in order to survive and make money. This very, very simple uh, motivation for this speech, I guess, is to say that it can be very useful to think about technology and how it changes the business environment and understand how technology changes so that you can change your strategy before you're forced to do it by changes in the business environment. It's much better to change before something happens and be ready for it than it is to have to change after the fact. So I think it's very important for business people to understand technology and I certainly think it's important for people who do technology like computer science students or people who study physics and math to understand how technology changes. So this is a little introduction. It's not, you know, there's lots of research into this, so I'm not going to do everything because I can't. But it's a little introduction, hopefully in a very simple language, so that almost uh, everybody can follow it. So here we go. All right, start with technology evolution over time. How does technology change? And I'll start by talking about a book by W. Brian Arthur. He is a technology economist and a technology historian and he's written an excellent book called The Nature of Technology where he defines what technology is uh, but also posits that technology changes because of four separate processes and the processes go on at the same time. So he says technology is a combination of components. Each component is also a technology. Well that introduces the concept of recursion which should be you know, well known to computer scientists. And each technology exploits an effect or a phenomenon, such as, for instance, electricity, uh, normally several of them. So it, it uses some sort of natural effect by doing something, usually combining it with other exploits of natural effects and, and putting it together. That is a technology. That's his definition. I prefer to think of technology very simply as ways of doing something. Um, that are repeatable and you can talk about them. And then it says innovation uh, happens in four processes and these processes happen at the same time. The first um, process is called standard engineering 
And standard engineering is what you know we do every day. We try to make things a little bit better. We fix errors and things get better. Then we have invention. That is when somebody really makes a big new step. And we'll talk about how that happens. Then we have something called structural deepening, which is not that the technology just gets better in performance, that it doesn't break down as often, but that it increases in functionality. It can do more things. And then we have this concept of general technologies or bodies of technologies. That's technologies that are new and can be used for many, many things at the same time. And they tend to emerge in a tree stage process. That's basically what W. Brian Arthur says. I encourage you to read that book because it's very well thought out. And it's the best example I've seen of somebody who actually has a theory of technology. He also says that innovation is not mysterious and it does not involve creativity. There is this sort of notion that innovation happens because people are smart and then something smart comes up. Um, and, you know, it helps to be very creative and live in creative environments and so on and so forth. And um, mostly innovation is hard work. Trying to make things a little bit better and then they get better. All right, let's start with problem solving or standard engineering. And that's what happens when we try to make a technology better. And technologies tend to change over time and they tend to change very slowly, often. And, all, some, and they change because people try to make things better over time. The example I use is from a book by a guy named Henry Petrovsky. And he talks about the evolution of everyday things. And one of the things he talks about is uh, cutlery, like knives and forks. You know, nowadays we don't eat with the knife. We don't use the knife to eat. But a hundred years ago, that was common. In fact, knives and forks looked like the ones you see here. Then, you know, they changed from roughly 1870, that's the first knife and fork you see here, to around the 1950s, um, which is the cutlery set you see here, which is, you know, something that my grandparents used to have. You see that, you know, the fork and the knife have changed quite dramatically. The knife has gotten narrower and the fork has gotten curved and looks more like a spoon. And if we go even further, you'll see that a modern set of cutlery looks like this. The, the fork is almost like a spoon and the knife is, you know, very difficult to eat with. So you see that with the early 100 years ago, you ate, you know, Basically, if you think in terms of jobs that technology does, you know, there are sort of three things you want to do with, with a knife and a fork. You want to pick up pieces that are big. Then you want to take big pieces and cut them into smaller pieces. And then you want to collect together the small things and move them to your mouth. And you can see that the third job, the small things, that's been moved from the, fork, from the knife to the fork. 100 years ago, we had knives that were very good at doing that. And then uh, now we have forks that are very good at doing that. And knives aren't so good. So how did that happen? Well, the answer is, it's the production process. We moved to, from hand making knives and forks to industrialization. In order to do that, we started to press out forks. You make a fork by going chunk on a piece of metal. But that kind of metal is not very strong. So instead of having just two uh, tines on a fork, you needed more and you needed to make them curve because then they're stronger. And you needed to put four of them next to each other. Um, and uh, and that, that's how the modern fork came about from the industrialization process. If you see the transition from the 1950s until now, now you see that, you know, things are all metal. You don't see plastic handles that much on everyday cutlery. And the reason for that, at least I think, is dishwashing machines. So there's sort of a gradual evolution where the technology for eating has changed very, very slowly. And that's because we fix errors because the environment changed and we adapt to it. Okay, that's standard engineering. That's what engineers do every day. You use something, you discover an error, then you fix it. So that was the first process, standard engineering. Okay, fixing everyday things and making them better. Okay, the next process. Well, invention. And the guy you see here is Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison was one of the most important inventors of all times. He invented the light bulb, 
the phonograph or gramophone, um, so you could have stored music. He invented a lot of the electrical infrastructure we have today, although he got it wrong in terms of alternating and, um, and um, ACDC, direct current. And, and, you know, he became a very rich man and he founded a company which now is called General Electric. Had lots and lots of patents. And we have this notion that Thomas Edison was kind of doing this by himself as a lonely inventor in a lab. Well, nothing can be further from the truth. Thomas Edison headed up a large organization of lots of technicians who worked in labs and they didn't um, invent, you know, by basically sitting down and having a bright idea. They invented by experimenting and fixing and testing and testing and testing until things worked. For the light bulb, there were two problems with the light bulb. First, you need to get the air out because if there's oxygen inside a light bulb, it'll go black from soot inside. Secondly, you need to find a material that can withstand the current inside the light bulb without breaking the, the thread inside. And they tested about 10,000 different combinations of products in order to fix that problem alone. So that's the first thing. There's lots of hard work and testing and testing and testing, but we think of it as a sort of bright idea. And secondly, Thomas Edison was not alone. There were lots of people experimenting with electric light. His version of electric light just happened to be the one that was commercially successful. There is a tendency among humans to want to attribute a new technology or a new invention or something that happened to a single person in a single time. So we think of it as a lonely inventor. Steve Jobs, who made the Apple computer together with Steve Wozniak. You know, he, Steve Jobs is dead. He can no longer defend himself. I think that 10 to 20 years from now, it will even say in the history books that Steve Jobs invented the personal computer. Well, he didn't. There were lots of people doing it. It just happened that the Apple II was the first commercially successful personal computer that was sold as a single unit that you could purchase without being technically competent. I think Steve Jobs would be the first person to say that he did not invent the personal computer. The message here is inventions happen, or, you know, brand new things that you can do, but they are normally a result of a long and hard work in order to do something. It's not just having the idea, but actually making it work. And that happens in the lab environment or a startup environment. And there are normally lots of companies doing it, but we tend to think of it afterwards as a brilliant genius working alone. Next one. Uh, what you see here are two cars. And what I'm talking about now is the third process, structural deepening. You know, you look at these two cars. They are both Fiat 500s. Um, I, forgotten what it's called but uh, in, in Italian but anyway the, the Fiat 500 the blue one you see here is from 1964 and it is uh, a tiny little car and it's called the Fiat 500 because the engine was half a liter big 500 uh, um, uh, cubic centimeters so you know very very small engine and it basically had four wheels and a steering wheel and very tiny brakes and nothing else it was just a it was a very dangerous car to drive Okay, in 1964, but it was cheap and it could fit four people, barely. Now, some years later, Fiat decided to make a new version of the 500 and it became this very attractive car that you see on the right, the white one. That is a 2009 model or something like that. I think I took that picture then. And that is something completely different. It has safety belts. It has um, strong headlights. It has airbags. It has independent suspension. It has uh, ABS brakes and air conditioning, and it has 122 horsepower. It's a huge engine in there. So it is a completely different kind of car, but we still think of it as a car. And what I'm meaning to say here is that the concept car is vastly different there are, there's about 40 years between these cars. They just are so different. But if you look at the export statistics for Italy, it still says one car if you sell one of these. And we actually underestimate the evolution of uh, living standards in the world because what the technology we have now, if you own a car now, you know something that is so much better than just 30, 40 years ago, but it's still, um, you know, we look upon it as one item. We so very often underestimate this so-called functional deepening 
A telephone used to be something you could talk in. A modern smartphone has basically everything you need. Navigation, camera, I'm filming this as an iPhone now. I certainly couldn't do that 40 years ago with a telephone. So, you know, that is the functional deepening. You can do more things. Here's another example. This is a car I own. It's from 1977. It's an old Mercedes with an enormous engine and a very unreliable technology. And I like it a lot. My children don't like the car at all. <laughs> and um, But at the time, this was pretty much the most advanced car you could buy in the world at that time, 1977. Of course, now it is not advanced at all, um, but I still like to own it because I like technology. All right. The fourth and final process is called emerging bodies of technology. Um, I don't think Arthur uses the term general technology, but a general technology is a technology that can be used in many settings, like computers, telephones, electricity, the internal combustion engine, railways, canals, which were the, you know, pre uh, or led to the industrialization in England. So these technologies are sort of general. They can be used for many things and they have a sort of vast impact on society, but it happens in three steps. Oh, well, the first step, you know, is substitution. That is when you take the new technology and you use it instead of what's there. Then the technology gets better and you get into an expansion phase where it becomes more and more popular and it's used by lots of people. Uh, and, and it's becoming cheaper so more people can use it. And then you have the structuration phase where you basically have a society and organizations and processes that are totally dependable, depending on the existing the existence of that technology. So let's look at these things. Okay, let's start by substitution. And, you know, when a technology is new, it is basically very bad. And, and it also looks like the old technology. So if you look at one of the first cars that you see here, this is a, a very early car. It basically looks like a horse carriage with an engine on it. And these things were not called cars. They were called horseless carriages. And that's because the, the main thing about this that was different from before was that there was no horse. Right? You know, and that's how technologies start, as substitutions. You used to have a horse to pull a car, now you have an internal combustion engine. Okay? And you remove the horse and you call it a horseless carriage. Now we're talking about self-driving cars. When self-driving cars become common, we will just call them cars. And we will refer to the old type of car as a user-driven car or human-driven car, because that is now the exception. So that changes over time. We tend to always do that. When we have a new technology coming in, we tend to make it in the image of the old technology. If you look at this next picture here, this is a virtual flight control tower. And uh, it's the Norwegian prime minister testing this one out at Avinui, which is the Norwegian um, authorities for, for um, airports. What you're doing here is you can run an airport remotely by sitting in something that looks like a tower and using computers and talking by radio and taking down planes on airports without being physically present at the airport. This is a very interesting technology. It's good use of computers. But I take a look at it and then I start thinking, hang on for a second. Why is this person sitting in something that looks like a tower? Because a tower is a technology. When you only had radio and no computers and no cameras, you needed a tower to look out over the airport and see what happened. I don't think you need that technology anymore. But I think flight controllers are used to being able to see out of a tower. And this is why they create something like this. And the first remote airports you'll see will have a tower somewhere or a room somewhere that looks like this. But gradually these windows or window-like structures will disappear and we'll use cameras out on the runway and various kinds of computer graphics to look where the plane is. New technology is always shaped in the image of the old, the first generation. And that you know you're in the substitution phase when the, the, the new technology looks like the old technology. Next phase, the technology gets better and better. We'll stick with cars because we've seen the evolution there and it's fairly simple. In order for 
a technology to become better and cheaper and available, uh, there are a number of things that have to happen. First of all, you have to get production going. Early on in a technology, most of the innovation is product innovation. You make something new. You make change the technology in itself. Cars used to look very different. They had three wheels, one wheel in front, two wheel in the back, maybe the other way. Some cars had just one headlight, some had three headlights, now they all have two. Gradually, cars started to look like each other and they started to produce them in factories. So this is the Model T, the first factory produced car. And when they started to produce them in factories, the price came down and more people could buy them. And actually, the, the price of a Model T went from something like $800 to $260 over a period of about something like 50 years, no, 15 years. So it got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Well, computers are getting cheaper and cheaper, right? So, okay. The second thing that happens is something called a dominant design. That, you know, there used to be lots of different kinds of cars. But gradually, they all started to look the same. And this is a, what the car you see here is a Chrysler 1927 Airflow. And this is generally regarded as the first modern car. It didn't have a frame, but it had an eggshell construction. It had the wheels, uh, a steering wheel where you expect it to be. It had a clutch and a brake and the accelerator. It had a gear stick where you expect it to be, and so on and so forth. Actually, I think it was on the, on, the, on the steering column. But anyway, if you are a modern car driver, you could probably get into this car and drive it. Because cars since then have largely been a Chrysler 1927 airflow. When the technology converges into one design, we start to refer to it as a dominant design. And that's a very, very important point in technology evolution because when the dominant design emerges, everybody starts to basically make the same product. And you stop competing on being different and start competing on being the same, but better. Smartphones, for instance, is an example of that. There were lots of different uh, smartphones available or telephones available. Then Apple came with the iPhone and now they all look like an iPhone and they don't compete on being different, but being like an iPhone, but better. So if you look at the Chrysler uh, 1927 Airflow, it basically is a modern car and every car that came since that one, oh, after a while, is basically a Chrysler 1927 Airflow, but it's faster or cheaper or safer or roomier or more comfortable, but it's basically the same product. So that's one thing that needs to happen, but you need to happen a lot of other things as well. For instance, um, you need to have somewhere to drive. So you need to have to develop uh, roads that are good. You need to develop services so you can refill your car. A car is not very useful um, if you have to carry all the gasoline with you because then you won't get far. That's why Tesla has been so successful. One of the reasons because they have developed the charging stations along with the cars. So you can charge the car as it goes along. And then there needs to be a culture around driving. So the book you see here, uh, this very old torn up book, is called the Michelin Guide, the Guide Michelin. And Michelin was a French uh, tire company. They made tires for cars. And they came out with a guide to restaurants. And the reason they did that is they wanted people to drive more so that they wore down their tires and had to replace them, hopefully with Michelin tires. And in order to do that, they started to list good restaurants that you could drive to. And the Michelin Guide has three, a three-star system. It says of a restaurant that if it has one star, it is worth a stop. If it has two stars, it is worth a detour to drive out of your way to visit it. And it says if the restaurant has three stars, then it is so good that it is a destination in its own right. That's the logic behind the Michelin three-star system. So you see this, you need to develop the infrastructure and the culture and the reason to use the technology more and it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and available for more and more people. People don't want cars, they want transportation, but gradually transportation is becoming available for everybody. It, you know, it used to be that people hadn't been more than maybe 50, 60 kilometers away from their hometown. Even until the 19, even until before the Second World War, that was probably true for most people. With the car, that changed, and now people travel everywhere. 
and we've got more transportation technology so we can travel everywhere. Except when there is a virus, of course. The third phase is called structuration. And this is a sociological concept. It basically, at least the way I interpret it, means that the availability of the technology reshapes our society, our businesses, our organizations, how we think about things. And the best example I know about that is IKEA. IKEA is a worldwide furniture store. Uh, it was founded in the 50s. My parents, I lived in Sweden when I was a child, uh, we drove to the first IKEA store. It was quite a long drive, a lot of hours to buy some furniture and we took it back on the roof of our car. This was in the sometime between around 1966. And um, uh, I remember what we bought. It was a pine kitchen table uh, and uh, we had it, my, my parents had it for many years. And it came in a flat pack uh, and we assembled it ourselves. And that was the logic behind IKEA. Sell cheap furniture to people who can come and pick it up by themselves. Take it home in their own car and put it together. That's the whole reason for IKEA existing. And that's been the logic behind IKEA up till about six or seven years ago when they noticed young people didn't have cars. And they had to start to think about mail order, showrooms and other things. But the logic that built IKEA was that it was conditioned on the fact that everybody had their own car and could transport stuff home, and that was cheaper and simpler. Okay, so there you have it, the four phases of W. Brian Arthur. Structural deepening, fixing problems. Invention, somebody comes up with a bright idea, usually after a lot of work. Functional deepening, oh sorry, um, functional deep, structural deepening, sorry, where you get lots, lots of new functionality in the technology, it can do more. And then you got this notion of general technologies that emerge, and they emerge in three steps. Um, substitution, expansion, and structuration. All right. This is sort of the first part of this presentation. Um, I'll just add on a little thing, something called architectural innovation, which is especially important when you think about information technology, but it happens with a lot of other technologies as well. And that's this notion of technology faces. Uh, I'll say this very briefly, just to trigger your mind, but technologies tend to go through phases. Here are some of the phases. Proprietary technology, modularized technology, commoditized technology, and then it can become ubiquitous or unnoticed. The first three are, you know, very observable. So a proprietary technology is where one company controls everything. And the company that does that now is Apple. Apple basically controls everything in the technology. They're, they sort of contain everything. And if you buy an Apple uh, product, you have to use Apple this and Apple that and so on and so forth. It's their own world and they control it. The wonderful thing about that is that they can create a whole good experience. The problem is that it tends to become expensive and you also tend to be very locked into that technology and not able to do things. So normally when a technology is new, it starts out. The first um, iPhone was completely locked down. The first Mac was completely locked down. You could only use Apple software on it. Gradually that changed. And gradually competitors emerge and these competitors might not be technically better, but they're more flexible and the technology becomes modularized. And an example of that is Dell. Dell sells computers, you can order them online, you can configure them however you want, and they send them home to you, and they build a business model out of building the technology the way you want it very fast. I should say now everybody does this, but Dell absolutely pioneered that business model. Okay, so and over time, modular technology outcompetes proprietary technology, especially at the lower ends of the market. So there are lots more Android telephones, which are more open standard than um, Apple phones in the world now, but Apple makes a hell of a lot more money. And then gradually the technology becomes commoditized. And that's when, cost when the technology becomes so good that the customers don't care about getting the best and the latest because the, the, what they already have is good enough. 
15 years ago, students would come to me and ask me about which computer they should buy. And they, I would have opinions and suggest this and this. Nobody asks me that anymore. And that's because if you're buying a computer in order to be a student, well, you can pretty much get anything you want. They're all good enough, basically, at least for standard work. Now, there are other evolutions that happen. A technology can become ubiquitous, which means it's available everywhere. And sometimes we talk about these as platform technologies, and Google is an example of that. It goes from being a specialized technology, search, to being something that's available everywhere. And also the technology can become unnoticed and invisible because it is everywhere. Uh, one example of that is a company called Otis. And uh, you may not know Otis, but I'm sure you have seen them. I normally ask people, you probably took an elevator, um, you know, not long ago. What was the brand name of the last elevator you took? Because the brand name will be there and it will be something like Tyson, Mitsubishi, Kony, uh, Schindel, Schindler, uh, or Otis. But you never notice because you don't notice that technology unless it breaks down. So technologies that only are noticed when they break down are basically invisible if they are reliable. And a lot of technologies evolve to be of that kind. So, and this is very important because when you are designing a technology and you're going out to compete on it, you have to understand which phase you're in because how you compete is extremely different based on which of these phases you're in. Okay, let's take a short break here. Okay, now I'm going to talk about one particular kind of technology evolution, and that's because it is quite important when we're thinking about business competition. If you're a company, you have to really think about this kind of technology evolution. And that's something called disruption. And more precisely, it's called disruptive innovation. And disruptive innovation is it's a, very, it's a very misused word. Lots of people, you know, they have a new product and they say, this is a disruptive product. And, and they refer to something as disruptive. People say, this technology outcompetes this technology. Well, it must be disruptive then. But that's not true. A disruptive technology is a very, very specific way in which one technology outcompetes another. And the concept was originated by this guy, a tall student from Utah. He, uh, his name is Clayton Christensen. He died uh, January 2020. He was a professor at the Harvard Business School and he was a brilliant person. And he wrote some very important books. He wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, which The Economist characterized as the most important management book in the 1990s. He wrote a book called The Innovator's Solution, which I highly recommend if you really want to get to grips with, with what disruption is, because he discusses it in, in more detail and suggests way to deal, ways to deal with it. So what is a disruptive innovation? If we make a drawing like this, and we say we have time on the x-axis, and we have quality on the y-axis, and uh, we say that over time, the quality that the average customer will expect will rise. If you're buying a car, if you're buying a Mercedes 2020 model, you expect it to be better than the 2019 model. Not a lot better, but a little bit better. So our expectations rise every year. And this is due to things like standard engineering, fixing problems, making things better. And then we can say that, you know, there are a bunch of customers. Some of them are very advanced and want the most important or the best product and they're willing to pay for it. And some just want something basic, simple. And uh, the drawing you see here is a normal distribution indicating that most customers are somewhere in the middle. That's very often the case. So this is what the demand side looks like, what the customers want, the average customer wants. Okay, then we say there's something called the pace of technological innovation. That is, when a technology starts out, it is pretty bad. The first car that was introduced, uh, it had one horsepower and no brakes. You know, very bad. <laughs> uh, but cars get better and better and better. 
Computers get better and better and better. Cell phones get better and better and better from, you know, weighing 10 kilos to being something you can record a video on. Things get better over time. And they can get better in small steps like this, small steps like this. And we call that incremental innovation. And then they can get better in larger steps, faster steps, long steps. And we call that radical innovation. But these kinds of innovations where the technology becomes better. We refer to that, or Clayton Christensen referred to that as sustaining innovations. These are innovations where technology, the product you have, gets better. If the competition is on that path, so that you, know, you have to make your product better, then the incumbent companies, the existing companies, tend to win because they have the money and the customer contacts and the knowledge to make the product better and better. And companies tend to be very, very good if, if your competitor makes a better product, you know what to do. You, know, you have to make your own product better. And in order to do that, you need new functionality, more quality, better performance, you know, things like that. And most companies are very, very good at doing it. And they do it because, you know, the customers are willing to pay more for a better product. Now, however, technologies can get worse. Because as you're going up and you're making better and better product, you notice that this blue arrow gets above the red arrow, which is what the average customer wants. So you get into a situation where the product that companies sell, it's much better than what the average customer wants. I'm sure a lot of you use Microsoft Word. Is there anyone out there who has <laughs> used all the functionality of Microsoft Word? Right? You can do lots of things with Microsoft Word. Most of us use just a few of the functions. We have way too much word processor. But, you know, for a lot of situations, you get into this where companies are competing on quality, which is much higher than what the customers want. And they tend to ignore the customers who just want the really cheap stuff because there's not much money to be made in that market. Then it can happen that somebody comes in with a new technology, a new way of doing things that's worse. And it appeals not to the good customers who are willing to pay a lot of money for a good technology, but to the cheap customers who can't afford the good technology. Of course, these companies who come in with a cheap technology, they are subject to the same pace of innovation. They make their product a little bit better, and then they have competitors who make it a little bit better, and they also go up a technological performance curve until they hit the average customer. And that's normally when the existing companies in the old technology became aware that this new technology exists. And there are lots of examples of this. There are examples in computers, in processor design, in hard disk design, in steel production, all kinds of things. When we have a disruptive technology, and that's what Clayton Christensen called these technologies, these, these new ways of doing things that are cheaper, then new companies tend to win uh, because the existing companies don't want to admit this new technology and they tend to respond by making their own product better and better. So we're going to look at an industry that not many people know anything about um, where this happens, just for illustration. And the technology is excavators, diggers, if you will, earth-moving equipment. And there was a huge technological shift in that industry. Uh, if we think back to the old days, uh, an excavator looked like something like this. And this excavator is cable drawn. If I draw you know, a circle around here, you can see that it, is a, it has steel cables and it's pulling the shovel uh, away from itself and turning around. And then it has this kind of um, thing, you know, the bottom opens up in the shovel. So it's sort of shoveling away from itself. That's how that works. In this industry, there were people who made small uh, excavators and people who made big excavators. Generally, you got paid a lot more for the bigger and best excavators because people who wanted big excavators were doing big things and they had more money. So the excavators tended to be compete on, on making the big ones. Okay, the companies. Okay, so what you see here is a small one. Here is a, a larger one. You know, excavators these days, they don't look like this anymore. Uh, but that's because there was a new technology that came along and it was this technology. And this technology is called hydraulics. And that is, instead of using cables to pull the, the shovel back and forth, you used hydraulics, where you pump oil into cylinders, which you call this here is a cylinder. 
and you pump oil or you suck out oil out of, of the cylinder and that moves this shiny thing, which is called a piston, in and out. And this technology is, is, uh, is better in many ways. You can, you can dig towards you, which is a better option in many senses, uh, in many ways, especially if you're trying to dig straight down. Um, and uh, it's also a much safer technology because if you're pulling very hard on a digger with a steel cable, it can snap. And then it comes like a whip and it can kill you. So in, in these old fashioned excavators, the, the driver had to sit in to inside a steel cage and there had to be a very large safety distance around it because of that. Uh, whereas these, one, these are easily controlled and, and, and a much smaller technology. The problem, of course, with this technology was that they, the, the hydraulics themselves were pretty bad in the beginning. They were very bad. If you try to really push, to really dig hard, then the cylinders couldn't take the pressure and they started to leak oil and then they just freeze up and you can't use the excavator. Specifically, it was around here, the rubber seal. That sealing technology just wasn't good enough. So if you put a lot of pressure on this, it would leak. And the problem is, you know, that if that technology is not strong, the only thing you can make is very, very small excavators like this one. Now think about it for a while. If you're somebody who is producing big excavators and then somebody comes along with a product like this, what do you think of it? You probably look at it and you say, that's not a real excavator. That's a toy like this, okay? It's a child's toy. And in the beginning, you know, these excavators were very small. They tried to make them bigger, but they were just bad. They broke all the time. So they had to make them small in order to make them dependable. And then gradually the technology for these rubber seals inside got better and better and better. And you got this thing, which is basically a tractor with a shovel in front and an excavator or a backhoe, as they're called, in the back. If you look at this product, this is actually a very useful product. This can be used by a lot of people, gardeners, people who dig ditches, uh, farmers, you know, and a lot of people can use something like this. So they became very, very popular. But of course, for the people who made the big excavators, they took a look at it and they said, well, <laughs> it might have gotten more advanced, but it's still a toy. Then the hydraulic excavators or the hydraulic backhoes, they're called backhoes because they dig backwards, uh, got better and better and better. So they got bigger. This is a much bigger one, much stronger. And then they got bigger. This is a very big machine. And then they got bigger. Here we have a military version, also extremely strong. And at present, this is the size they're at, the hydraulic excavators. What was the response of the people who made the cable-operated excavators? Did they just give up? No, what they did was they said, well, these guys are making small excavators. We're making big excavators. We're making much more money per excavator than these small ones. So we're basically saying, we'll no longer produce these small ones, but we'll continue to produce the big ones because that's where the profitability is. And that's true. But eventually that market gets smaller and smaller and smaller because the new technology gets better and better and better. That is what happens when you have a disruptive innovation. There are still uh, cable operated excavators. You can find them, here is an example, but they are now just used in extremely large digging situations where you have to excavate coal from open day mines and so on and so forth. And they are gradually disappearing. There are still some around. I can't, um, I, I have to show you the, my favorite excavator in the whole world. It's the biggest moving or drivable machine uh, in the world. And this is used somewhere in a coal field in Germany. I'm not sure where. The people who who um, made this one. I'm sure they made money, but the market for these enormous ones is very small. Essentially, there's a market for one. Okay, and now, of course, the new hydraulic excavators have taken over the market. And we've seen this happen in lots and lots of industries, that a new technology comes in, it appeals to the cheap customers, and it is ignored, at least in the beginning, by the existing manufacturers. Very, very dangerous. You have to think about it. How do you recognize a disruptive innovation? I'll give you an example from Norway. 
One way you know that something is disruptive is if it's if the existing companies run to the government for protection. Not long ago, these two guys here, they invented a new kind of hairdresser in Norway. They basically said hairdressers are expensive, especially for women. They offer a lot of fancy things. You can color your hair. You can have all kinds of fancy ways of treating your hair, making it fall this way or that. You can do, they can do lots of things, but they tend to be expensive. What they did was to say, we are going to create a new kind of hairdresser, which is going to be cheap. It's one low price, same for men and women. It's uh, about, it's 2.99 kroner in Norway. That's about $30. And that's the only thing they do. And they guarantee it's going to take 15 minutes. So there, it's one product, one price, 15 minute haircut and 30 bucks. They made a, a hairdress salon like that. And it was very popular because for most people, a simple, cheap haircut is what they want. And cutters was, you know, great in terms of being a very, very simple concept. Also, their costs were low because they didn't offer hair washing. So they didn't need to have hair washing equipment. They didn't need to have very expensive equipment in their salons because it was all go in, get a haircut, go out again. That's it. How are the existing hairdressers supposed to respond to this? They can't. Because these guys, they can't do the same thing because they're killing their own profitable market for bleaching of hair or coloring of hair or fancy cutting and so on and so forth. So instead they ran to the government and they said, shouldn't it be a rule that says that hairdressers need to offer hair wash for health and hygiene reasons? And they actually went to the government and demanded that. And uh, the health authorities said, well, no, <laughs> uh, you can cut hair without washing it first. If the hair is very dirty, the only thing the hairdresser needs to do is refuse to cut the hair. This is an example that shows that this is not just technology, it's ways of doing things. It's when you come in with a cheap offering that appeals to customers who don't need the advanced things that you make a lot of money on. And it's also where the existing competition can't really respond without losing their profitability. So that's a disruptive innovation. So we say that a disruptive innovation you recognize because your best customers don't want it. The customers who pay lots of money at hairdressers, they don't want a simple haircut. It offers poor performance. A simple haircut is a worse product than you know a very fancy haircut with a hair wash and coloring and whatever it is they do. Okay, it is. And then lastly, if you try to do it, you would lose money. So you really can't go there. And those are the three characteristics of a disruptive innovation. Well, I'm going to finish off here, but you know, this is a whole course in saying, what do you do if you are an existing company and you are being disrupted, somebody's coming. So I'll just say very briefly, there are four things you can do. Um, you, can cannibal you can cannibalize yourself. That is, you can go into this new way of doing things and think that, well, in the end, I'm going to make less money but if I'm the first to do this and I outcompete not just myself, but my other existing competitors, at least I will be existing afterwards. So, you know, and that takes a lot of leadership to be able to do that. You can also do something called value chain evolution, which means you can move to somewhere else in the value chain. So, for instance, if you are somebody who makes a product and there are new competitors coming in that offer cheaper products that the customers want and they don't want your expensive good products. Well, maybe you can think, I don't need to offer it as a product, I can sell it as a service. Or I can go backwards in the value chain and I can sell components that make it into the product or something like that. You can also let the customer hire you. And this is a long discussion, but it's basically a way of thinking about what is it the customer really wants and then say, okay, can I provide that instead? The old way of saying it is if you sell drills to, you know, if you sell drills to people so they can make holes, the customers don't want drills, they want holes. So can you sell holes instead? Is there another way of doing it where you can make money instead of just selling the traditional product? And then the last one is, uh, I just call it cheat. And uh, cheating is, is, uh, is simple in the sense that very often, 
people succeed uh, when they do something new by breaking traditional cultural ways of doing things in an industry. And very often that is referred to as cheating. But maybe it isn't cheating. Maybe it's just a smart way of doing things. So these are the things you need to think about if somebody hits you with a disruptive innovation. A final point here. We tend to think of technology as coming very fast. But actually what happens is it takes much longer than we think and it tends to the impact of the technology tends to be much bigger than we think. I'll just show an example. What you see here is a factory line, and this is a factory from the first uh, industrialization, where the technology that produced power was hydropower or steam. And in order to transfer the power from the power source and into the factory, you used belts and pulleys. So what you see here are belts that transfer the power, there's a belt here, that transfers the power down to the machine. And this is how you transfer power from a power source into a machine. So you lined up the machines, and then you had all these belts going down to the machine. And then around 1870, and 1880, 1890, we had a process of electrification, which is often called the second industrial revolution. And that's where you got rid of all these belts they were very, very dangerous and very noisy. And instead you had electricity. So that you had a power source, but you transferred the power into an engine that was on each individual spinning machine or whatever it was you made. So you would no longer have all these belts that you see um, up here. Instead, you would have a motor on each production unit and you can turn it on and off and it was much safer and much less noisy. Okay, wonderful. Here's the thing. Can you guess how long it took from switching to electricity to understanding that you no longer had to line the machines up according to where the belts and pulleys had been in the ceiling? Well, I'll give you the answer. It took 40 years, okay? Because you put the machines in and lined them up this way, and that was the way we did factories, and we built factories so that they were shaped for that. And then you switched out the technology, but you continue to do it the same way. It's the same thing with teaching, like I'm doing now. Okay, We've been, we got technologies for teaching, like recording and video conferencing and so on, 25 years ago. But we continue to ignore the technology and continue to teach the same way that you know we've always been doing. Now we're switching to video conferencing, but we still continue to teach. I'm basically giving a lecture. How long will it take before we change totally the way we do teaching because we have this new technology and now we're forced to do it? I think it will take many years yet. And I think one of the things that need to happen is that old people like me need to disappear from the universities in order for younger people to come in who's always had this technology, who's always put themselves on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and whatever it's called and are used to that way of communicating. That's when we'll see the change, not before. It always takes much longer than we think, and the things that change slowly is the organization and our way of thinking about things. And that was my last slide. So thank you very much for listening, and um, well, goodbye. So, um, <clears throat> um, is, um, um, okay. Okay. I'm going to be able to say goodbye. Yes. Okay. Hi. Okay, I'm going to do this in English. Can you know? <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't wear a bow tie normally at breakfast. Do you? Just happen to be the first. Nei, vi sitter og spiller i en video. Er det interessant nok, eller? Ja, det er bare jeg har hørt alt før. Har du hørt? Ja, du har jo tatt det faget på NTNU, da. Hæ? Du har jo tatt det faget på NTNU, har du ikke det? Nei, jeg har hørt alt fra deg fra før av. Ok, greit. Dette er det du snakker om til vanlig. Nå ble jeg deprimert. Hahaha!